Okay, so so far we've um, reviewed all the algebra around factorization of polynomials. We've looked at the simplest kind of polynomial graphs where they're just transformations of x to the power of n. Um, and here now we're going to look at two things. We're going to look at both solving and sketching polynomials of degree 3 or higher. So where we might need all of those algebra um, skills to come together to help us um, sketch the graph. Um, Okay, so again, if we're just focusing on solving, first of all, the null factor law um, can be extended to deal with cubics, quartics, higher degree polynomials, because again, we know the null factor law from quadratics. If I've got two things multiplying together to equal zero, that means that either A equals zero or B equals zero. But that would extend if I have three things multiplying together to equal zero. One or other or all of those things has to be zero. Um, so the key idea in solving cubics, which can't, the cubics and quartics and higher degree polynomials, which can't be rearranged, so the ones we looked at in the previous video, where they're in that stationary point form, we don't need any special techniques to solve those, but where they're not in that form, we're going to attempt to factorise and use the null factor law. Unlike quadratics, if factorising fails, there is no cubic formula. Um, so for all intents and purposes for this year will only be dealing with cubics that are either in that stationary point form or that can be factorised. Okay, solve each of the following equations. So the first equation is already factorised and it's already equal to zero, so we're already in a position to straight away go on and use the null factor law. Three things multiplying together to equal zero, so either x plus one equals zero, which would mean that x would equal negative one, or two minus x equals zero, which means that x would equal two, or 3x minus 5 equals 0, which means x is going to be 5 on 3. Okay, part B, we've already got the null part of the null factor law, so we need to first of all focus on factorising the left-hand side. Common factors there, 2x squared leaves us with 1 minus 3x squared. So then null factor law tells us either 2x squared equals 0, which is x squared equals 0, which means x equals 0, or 1 minus 3x squared equals 0. So 3x squared equals 1, x squared equals 1 third, and so x could be plus minus square root of 1 third, which is plus minus 1 on root 3, or plus minus root 3 on 3. Either of these is fine. Um, okay. Part C, solve each of the following equations. So we've got the null part of the null factor law. We want to focus on factorising the left-hand side. Um, again, first thing is to look for common factors, and there is a common factor of x here. So if we take x out, we get left with x squared minus 8x minus 20. All right, and then we're looking to factorise the quadratic. So factors of negative 20 that add up to negative 8. Uh, it's going to be something to do with 10 and 2, I think. So it's going to be minus 10 and plus 2. And so therefore, x equals 0, or x minus 10 equals 0, which means x equals 10, or x plus 2 equals 0, which means x equals negative 2. All right, and then part D, uh, we've got a cubic, one side 0. We're trying to factorise the other side. There's no common factors there. So factorising a cubic, we first need to try and find ourselves a factor. P of 1 is 2 minus 5 plus 1 plus 2. That is 0. Okay, so that's good news. That means that x minus 1 is a factor. Once we've identified our factor, we do our long division or our synthetic division. Or any other method you might have. 2x cubed minus 5x squared plus x plus 2. What do we multiply x by to get 2x cubed? That's 2x squared. Multiply 2x squared by x minus 1. 2x cubed minus 2x squared. Subtract. Negative 5 minus minus 2 is negative 5 plus 2, which is negative 3. Bring down our next term and repeat again. What do we multiply x by to get negative 3x squared minus 3x? Multiply negative 3x by x minus 1, minus 3x squared plus 3x, and subtract x minus 3x is negative 2x. And bring down our final term. We multiply x by to get negative x squared, sorry, negative x, which is negative 2. So 
sorry, what do we multiply x by to get negative 2x? That's negative 2. Then we take negative 2 multiplied by x minus 1, which gives us negative 2x plus 2, which indeed leaves the remainder of 0. Okay, so now we've gone from the cubic. We now know that it is, so it was the cubic equal to 0. Sorry, the cubic is the same as x minus 1 times 2x squared minus 3x minus 2 equals 0. So now we're just trying to, this is going to give us x equals 1. Now we're just solving this quadratic, 2x squared minus 3x minus 2 equals 0. No common factors, need to factorise. Factors of negative 4 that add up to negative 3. So that's minus 4x and plus x. Common factors in the first two terms are 2x x minus 2, common factors in the second term, two terms, just 1 times x minus 2. Uh, okay, and then taking out that common factor of x minus 2 leaves us with 2x plus 1. And null factor law here tells us that that means that x equals 2, and this one means that x equals negative a half. So we have our three uh, solutions there. It's a long-winded process factorising and solving a cubic. There's no way around it. If it was a quartic, you would use the factor theorem to find the first factor. You'd then do long division, which would give you a, cubic, a linear times a cubic. Then you'd use factor theorem to find a factor of the cubic. Then you'd do the long division um, until you've then got linear times linear times quadratic, and then you factorise the quadratic. Alternatively, you use the factor theorem a bit longer, and you find a couple of factors using the factor theorem, and then you do just one division. Um, and obviously, it only it, you only end up doing more divisions the higher the degree of the polynomial. Okay, but essentially, if the cubic or quartic or higher degree polynomial cannot be rearranged, so isn't in that stationary point form that we saw in the previous video, we're looking to factorise and use the null factor law. Okay, then let's get on to sketching graphs of polynomials. So polynomials that aren't in that stationary point form. And unlike quadratics, in the case of a quadratic, every single quadratic equation can be written in turning point form. Okay? Other higher degree polynomials, not every cubic or quartic or degree 5 or degree 28 polynomial can be written as a times x, x minus h to the power of 5 plus k. Okay? Um, so they don't all look like those shapes that we saw in the last video. There are other things that can happen. And in fact, loosely speaking, when we're dealing with polynomials, a linear function is a straight line. A quadratic function, so it has no turning points. A quadratic function is a parabola, we're familiar with that, has one turning point. A cubic, oops, sorry, a cubic might have two stationary points, sorry, that's four, <laughs> might have two stationary points. A quartic might have three stationary points, etc. Okay, so as you increase the degree of the polynomial, the maximum number of stationary points increases by one. Okay, so what we're looking at in this video is these kinds of these shaped cubics and quartics. We know a cubic can also have one point of inflection. We know a quartic could instead have one more flat-bottomed turning point. Okay, a quartic could also have. If we think about this, you can loosely think about one point of inflection is equivalent to two turning points. So what could actually happen is we could, in a quartic, take two of the three turning points and combine them together as a point of inflection to have something like that. Um, so there are lots of combinations of what might happen, and that only increases as you increase the degree of the polynomial. So the key thing is, is if it's not in that stationary point form and therefore it's not this kind of shape, we then want to think about finding the x-intercepts, finding the y-intercepts, and using that to help us with the shape. For now, we're not worried about turning points. Until we review calculus later in the year, we're not going to be expected to find the coordinates of the turning points. We're just interested in getting the shape right. Now, what happens is, is once we've got our quadratic factor, uh, sorry, our polynomial factorised, the factors tell us lots of things. They absolutely tell us where the x-intercepts are, because if you have a polynomial that is, you know, y equals x plus 1, x minus 3, and x plus 5. When you find the x-intercepts, you let y equal 0, and you get x equals negative 1, 
x equals 3 and x equals negative 5, and they are the three x-intercepts. So the factors immediately tell you where the x-intercepts are. The other thing the factors tell you is about the shape at that x-intercept. So in this case, these are all just to the power of 1, and so the graph just cuts through the x-axis at all of those points. I like to think about it as power of 1, that's linear, degree 1 polynomial, the graphs at that x-intercept look linear. Okay, so we're at negative 1, the graph is linear. It might only be linear for a moment, but it's going straight, it cuts through. If this was a squared on this one, at x equals negative 1, the graph would behave like a quadratic. We get a quadratic looking turning point. If it was a degree 3 here, at that x-intercept, the graph would behave like a cubic. You get a point of inflection. If there was a power of 4 here, at that x-intercept, the graph would behave like x to the power of 4, which is a turning point, but one of those more flat bottom turning points. If it was degree, if it was power of 5 here, it'd be a more extreme point of inflection, okay, etc, etc, etc. So once we've got the equation factorised, we know where the x-intercepts are and the behaviour or shape of the x-intercepts. So a linear factor or a factor to the power of 1 would just cut through the graph at that point. A factor to the power of 2 will give you a sort of parabolic looking turning point. A factor to the power of 3 will give you a um, cubic looking point of inflection. A factor to the power of 4 will give you a sort of quartic looking turning point, etc, etc. Okay, let's sketch some graphs. Clearly labelling all axis intercepts with their coordinates. For now, I'm not worried about labelling the turning points. Okay, so sketch the graph here. So the first thing I want you to think about is what is the degree of the polynomial? And in this case, so that is, if you were to expand it all out, what is the highest power of x going to be? And that's going to come from the x in this bracket, and there'll be an x cubed come from here. So x times x cubed is going to be x to the power of 4. So it's a degree 4 polynomial. The next thing I want you to think about is, is it positive or negative? Is the leading term positive or negative? So in this case, it's going to be positive x to the power of 4. If I were to expand those brackets out, it's going to give me positive x to the power of 4. Now, if you've got an even positive even degree polynomial, even degree polynomials, so quadratic, quartic, um, degree 6, degree 8, etc. If it is positive x squared, positive x to the 4, positive x to the 6, they'll look like this. If it was negative x squared, it gets reflected in the x-axis. If it was, had negative x to the power of 4 as the leading term, reflected in the x-axis. Negative x to the power of 6, reflected in the x-axis. So if it is a negative, the leading term of an even degree polynomial is negative, the graph starts down and finishes down. If it's positive, starts up and finishes up. Okay. So in this case, we have a... Um, even degree polynomial with a positive leading term. So the graph is going to start up and finish up. Okay, it might have a might have a point of inflection in there. We don't know about that, but it's going to start up and finish up. So you want to think about those three things. What is the degree, and in which direction is it going to go? Then we want to think about the x-intercepts, and they come from the factorized. So zero equal. We let y equal zero. So therefore those brackets tell us exactly where the x-intercepts are. There is an x-intercept at x equals 1, and that's a power of 1. So the graph is just going to cut through the x-axis at this point. And there is an x-intercept at x equals negative 2, and that's a power of 3. So we're going to get a point of inflection at this one. Okay, sorry. All right, so let's work out our y-intercept at x equals 0. So it's going to be negative 1 times 2 cubed. Negative 1 times 8, so negative 8. Okay, so we've got x-intercepts at negative 2 and 1 and a negative y-intercept. Okay, we decided it was a positive um, leading term, in it, so it's going to start up and finish up. Okay. We've got a point of inflection at this negative 2, so it starts from above, point of inflection here, that's how we get down to this negative y-intercept. Now, I find students always try to 
bend their graph to get the turning point happening at the y-intercept. There's absolutely nothing to say that the turning point will happen at the y-intercept. It might, and in this case it's not much of a bend to get it happening there, but there's no need to make it happen at that point. Okay, we're not calculating where it is. Um, it's, it's highly unlikely it's happening at the y-intercept. So please don't, you know, draw a skewed looking graph just to try and get it to turn at the y-intercept. Just give a sort of natural shape to it. Wherever it crosses the y-axis, it crosses the y-axis. Okay, so this is the point one zero. We've cut through the x-axis there. This is the point negative two zero. We've got our point of inflection there. This is the y-intercept at zero negative eight. Quartic starts up and finishes up because it's a positive quartic. Okay, let's have a look at the next one. Sketch the graph of this. Okay, so what's the degree? So it is degree, um, well maybe I'll just think about it, if you were to expand it all out, you're going to have a 2 because of that, you're going to have negative x times x squared uh, times x, so it's going to be negative x to the power of 4. Okay, so it's a quartic again, but this time it's a negative quartic. Okay, um, so we want to think about that. We can see that our x-intercepts, we have that y equals 0, our x-intercepts are going to be at x equals 1, where the graph will cut, because it's a linear factor. We're going to be at x equals negative 3, where we'll get a turning point. And we're going to be at x equals negative 4, where the graph will cut through the x-axis again. Okay. Um, y-intercept, let x equal 0, so we're going to get y equals 2 times 1 times 3 squared times 4. So that's 2 times 9 times 4. 2 times 4 is 8. 8 times 9 is 72. Okay, so negative quartic start down and finish down. Let's think about where those x-intercepts are. Negative 4, negative 3... I'm noticing the big y-intercept, so I'm thinking about that when I'm placing my x-axis. Okay, so 1, 2, 3, 4, negative 4, negative 3, and 1. It's my three x-intercepts. Um, we're going to have the turning point. Okay, so we're going to start from below. So it's going to start down here. We know it cuts through here. Then we're going to need a turning point here, and then we're going to cut through here again. Okay, so... We're going to start down here, we're going to have a turning point here, we're going to have that, that matches with our positive y-intercept, and okay, it looks like, I'm just going to do that again, it looks like I've, I need it to turn a bit before then I think, so it will come back down for that. That's what I mean by try not to bend it to actually have its turning point at the y-axis intercept, it probably won't happen there. 0, 72. 1, 0, negative 3, 0, negative 4, 0. So if you've watched the earlier videos looking at linear functions, it's the quadratic functions, um, please get in the habit of marking your graphs with coordinates. VCAR always ask for your graphs to be labelled with coordinates, and if they aren't coordinates, they're wrong. Okay. If they don't specify coordinates, you're not going to be wrong by writing them as coordinates. So get in the habit of it, make it routine, always label all points on your graphs using coordinates. Alright, um, the work today that I'm sending you is actually from a worksheet, um, which is in Appendix A of your booklet.